Hello and welcome to Coronanomics What Just Happened, brought to you by Econ Films, where we look at the biggest events of yet another historic week with you, our live audience. So please join the conversation and ask us a question on our YouTube comments or on Twitter using the hashtag Coronanomics. I'm Lizzie Burden, economics reporter at The Telegraph. And I'm Ben Chu, economics editor of The Independent. So once again, the last seven days have given us huge coronavirus related developments all around the world a 750 billion euro rescue plan proposed by the european union and national security grab by china in hong kong and here in the uk we've been obsessing about bluebells eye tests and whether you can get up from london to durham on a single tank of petrol joining us to talk about dominic cummings a little and some other things a little bit more are Richard Davies and Miata Fanbula. Hi, Hi. Hi. Hello. So Richard's a former advisor to George Osborne when he was UK Chancellor, and he's also the author of Extreme Economies, Lessons from the World's Limits, which came out last year and will be out in paperback in July. Miata is the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation think tank and is also a former government advisor. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, and don't, thank you. And don't forget, if you've got any questions for us, ask on the YouTube comments or on the Twitter on Twitter using hashtag Coronanomics. So let's talk about moments of the week. So first of all, if we can go to you, Miata, what moment, apart from Dominic Cummings, stood out for you? Yeah, so Dominic Cummings was definitely not the highlight of my week. Uh, the highlight of my week was actually um, a report that uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies put out um, about the impact of the lockdown um, on women. Uh, so we know that everyone is being hit by this, but we also know that actually some groups are being hit disproportionately uh, worse. Um, and you know, their analysis suggests that mothers are 50% more likely to lose their jobs uh, than fathers in this. Uh, and which is a huge, huge step back. Uh, you know, having worked really, really hard for women to have kind of parity, we're not there yet. But the idea that this crisis could set, you know, a generation of women backwards, I think, is hugely worrying, um, and something that we need to think about. And it kind of adds on to that the sort of childcare dimension. Mm. Um, and you know, increasingly, when schools are closed in the household, you know, mothers are picking up the strain of this. And if it continues for a sustained period, we're likely to see more mothers dropping out the labour market, which would be a huge, huge shame. Yeah, and that, that report really made clear that the division of childcare and housework was unequal in lockdown family homes. But um, Richard Davies, you've got, a, you've got a particular reason to be doing your share of the childcare at the moment. Do you want to tell us what it is? Oh, thank you. Yeah, we had twins. Um, uh, about a week into lockdown, um, and we've already we have a two-year-old boy, so uh, we got hit by a sort of like the economy in general. I think got hit by a double whammy of su supply and demand, in that our kind of demand for childcare went up, and our supply in terms of helpful gran grannies and stuff went right down to, the, to zero. So yeah. Well, many congratulations from all of us, of course. Um, Thank you. Do you want to do you want to tell us about what your moment of the week was? Yeah, I want to raise something um, completely different. I think that's a bit overlooked, which is prices. Um, pretty simple thing in, in economics, it can be seen, but, I, but they're, they're really important. They are timely, so they, they come out um, very quickly. So we have prices, we know what's happened to the prices during the, uh, the past month or so. Here's a chart actually that I put together with today's data. And, and two things. So the first thing is that um, there are a load of goods, and um, the ONS is calling them high demand products that people, we've got really worried about. It's things like loo roll, pasta, and there's three of them here, hand wash, long life milk, and paracetamol, where we saw quite sharp spikes and they were going up pretty quickly. So it's a, that's a five, over 5% rise in terms of those painkillers. But actually the positive thing in terms of these high demand products, this is online data the ONS has collected, um, is actually, it looks like supply chains are working pretty well. Yes, yeah, so over 10 weeks, there's been 2% inflation. That's higher than the, the Bank of England's target. But, but really, that's a pretty positive story about how supply chains are working. And hopefully, one of the things we can get into is supply chains, because I'm seeing a lot of stuff about we should shorten supply chains. We need to completely reform them. I actually think it's wrong. 
and it's even risky. Um, hopefully we can dig into that. But then the other yeah. thing we've seen in, in prices in the much bigger micro data set, the one that underlines are the ONS data, is some really big shifts um, and principally massive drop in fuel. So kerosene is something that, that the ONS tracks in terms of a, a, a commonly used, used fuel. Um, around, I think 100% of the prices they collect changed and about 95% of them were cuts. So massive cuts in fuel across the board. And then big cuts in things where you need sort of consumption items where you need to travel to get them. So for me, I'm about to put out a paperback book, a worrying one is huge cuts in book prices. And I think this, this trend tells us that we're about to see big shifts in our economy away from things that require travel. Richard, where you said about um, not shortening supply chains, not bringing stuff home, what about PPE? Should that be an exception? You know, um, it, it is so necessary, but we were really held back by the spike in air freight rates. Isn't that one, one exception that we should make for next time? Yeah, it's a really good question. And there's a huge parallel here, I guess, with agriculture following the Second World War. And the common agricultural policy, I mean, so the, base, the basic idea is you want to be self-reliant, right? You, in, a, in a time when you can have a war, you don't want to re rely on another country for food. And so countries are tempted to become self-reliant in terms of food. In certain sort of really strategic things, um, another one typically is defence, right? But yeah, maybe PPE, if we think this, this kind of stuff is going to happen more, is one way you'd want to have guaranteed supply. But the reason why I think we need a proper conversation about it is like, imagine the situation if we did become as a country completely self-sufficient and we as a country, as a small island, got really badly infected by a virus. So everything was getting produced in country. Actually, modern trade theorists and, and, and trade researchers see trade as a kind of insurance that you're specifically not producing everything in your country and you're able to get it from abroad. Um, and so that's why I think this idea that, you know, it's the end of globalization, supply chain should be completely shortened is a, is a really misleading one. I feel like the messages coming out from Liz Truss and um, the Department for International Trade have been really positive on that note. And lots of um, trade experts that I speak to have been really um, encouraged by the um, embracing of globalization and not the, the, the and DIT not calling to um, bring supply chains home. But do you think that there might be a snowball effect of um, countries like the USA calling for the decoupling from China? And if, if it's going on around the world and protectionism is going up around the world, as we're seeing, um, there's data from the Global Trade Alert, for example, how could we not be doing that? Do you know what I mean? If there's a snowball effect, how yeah. do we stay out? No, no, I'd put it differently. I'd say there, there already was a snowball and this adds more snow to that ball. Um, and that, <laughs> snowball, that snowball can be seen both here in, in the UK with concern over our trading relationship with the EU. Some of it, people wanted a better trading relationship. Some people, a good group of people just you know, aren't enthused by trade and globalization, and, and, but much more big time in the US with Trump's relationship with China. Um, and now we're seeing, Ben, you mentioned it in your intro, really, for me, has been blasted out of the news by other stuff, all this stuff that's going on with China, both with Hong Kong and with India. Um, you know, these, if, if you think as, as, a, as an economist that trade is a good thing in general, these are pretty worrying times. Yeah, I sometimes yeah. think that the, um, the, uh, the whole Brexit and the trade war thing kind of primed us to think about issues like um, supply chains before this started out. So in that sense, we were, we were kind of intellectually prepared to a certain degree. I want to go to a question from an audience member, Ekaterina from University of Bristol. Hi, I'm Ekaterina from the University of Bristol. And my question is, could inflating our way out of COVID-19 be a plausible option for the UK, despite the real wages and inequality concerns that come with it. I wonder if, uh, Miata, you could feel that one. What, what do, you, do you think some people say inflation is sort of very likely to happen um, after this is over? Do you think it's inevitable? I think it may happen, but I think the imperative has to be uh, to protect living standards in this. Uh, we know that 
you know, the hit to livelihoods is going to be huge. Um, and this comes off the back of, you know, 10 years in which, you know, wages were pretty much stagnant, in which living standards pretty much didn't shift since, since 2008. So the idea that we can have a sustained period where families and households take another hammering, I just think is inconceivable. So I think the priority for policymakers um, will have to be to try to manage uh, inflation, will have to be to try to manage the cost of living. Some will happen through the market, some will require big interventions, quite frankly, from the government, um, big interventions of the Bank of England to ensure that we do that. But I don't think we can underestimate, you know, people band around stats, you know, big numbers to talk about this economic crisis. It is a crisis, in some respects, a bit unlike 2008, that is going to hit family pockets and pay packets first and foremost. And we don't have the cushion. We just don't have the cushion in the system. You know, families that... You know, the stats on this, even before the crisis, were quite staggering. You know, people who, well, two million households um, have had savings that would only last them one week. Uh, a third of households is claimed a sort of t a paycheck away from financial ruin. The idea that that cannot be the imperative of, as we manage through this crisis, I think is for the birds. That has to be the focus. So it doesn't feel to me plausible uh, that we can kind of inflate our way out of this if there is a knock-on effect on living standards, on real wages, and on inequality. Yeah, It's really absolutely. interesting just, that you should... Oh, go on. Yeah, can I just... I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I would do. I worked at the Bank of England for a long time, so I've been sort of trained, you know, inflate, must not inflate your way out of this stuff. Um, inflation really isn't a free lunch. And the reason it isn't a free lunch is because there's... It, and it can seem like it is because you inflate away your debts, mortgages become less burdensome and so on. But... People that are savers, and particularly people that have an income that's coming in a set um, pound amount, an nominal amount, we'd say as economists, that gets eroded by inflation. And just to just to um, amplify what Miata was saying, and something actually I only realised sort of a few years ago, you know, despite having been an economist for ages, when you see those decile charts, like households by decile. Um, that the you know the Resolution Foundation does a lot, the IFS does them a lot, but probably um, viewers have seen them. I always used to think that the people in the bottom decile would be you know maybe like a single mum with lots of kids, big you know financial constraints, mm -hmm. but it, it's not because those people get um, are helped uh, rightfully by the benefit system. The people in that re very bottom decile one often tend to be single people and older and on their own. And those people are often relying on a, on a, a, a fixed pound amount uh, of, of income through some savings potentially that, that they have or, um, or their pensions. And if you inflate that away, you really hit a very vulnerable um, uh, part, of, uh, part of the society, essentially. Yeah. It's so we're going to come back to be... It's interesting that you should um, both say that we should keep a close eye on inflation um, when, you know, some people have been saying that it's even harder to collect accurate inflation data at the moment because maybe not all the same items are available. And um, at this time when uh, we need to be, you know, really focusing on getting a V-shaped recovery, we've even had calls for um, switching the Bank of England's targeting from inflation to um, nominal GDP. Do you think that's crazy a crazy idea for the for the time well, well so i mean i think a v-shaped recovery is eluding us um you know the the, the um, andrew bailey this week came out saying that we're looking at a kind of a longer more painful recovery um i think there's probably likely to be consensus around that um you know and my view is actually i, I do think the bank of england should have a wider remit um and that wider remit is not necessarily driven by the desire for growth it's driven by other factors like think about climate change or other um indicators um but but i do think the combination of uh, you know the Treasury and the Bank of England, data will be difficult. But quite frankly, data through this crisis is going to be difficult. Um, you know, we are going to probably see a lag in our understanding of what's happening in the real economy. Um, but but we're going to have to try and find a way to get a grip on it, just because I think the co the implications of it, the impacts of it, will just be, I think, politically unacceptable and also economically unacceptable. Yeah, well, on the subject of economic acceptability, Lizzie, do you want to give us your moment of the week? 
Okay, so uh, first of all, we had Project Birch. So the Treasury said that it's ready to step in to support coronavirus ravaged firms um, whose collapse would harm the economy. Um, and the, the, the idea is that if firms have no other option for funding, then the government will step in. So Virgin Atlantic, Jaguar Land Rover are reportedly in talks about potential assistance. But at the same time, um, there are talks about potentially Britain having its first ever sovereign wealth fund um, so for completely different kinds of companies it's startups that are promising and um, could get us out of the recession and um, to help us with the leveling up agenda and the rumors are that Jim O'Neill the former Goldman Sachs economist and Treasury Minister who's on our show this week if you catch our next Don't episode of Chrononomics um, he could be the one to head it up um, so I'm wondering, Miata, do you think that this is uh, there are actually much less risky ways to address regional inequality than using taxpayers' money to back startups? Well, so I think because the economic crisis is so, um, well, I should start by saying that actually I think it is a job of government to try and invest in uh, the economy, to try to kind of invest in help businesses get along anyway. But because we are in an unprecedented economic crisis, you know, a recession that potentially is deeper than a recession we've seen for 300 years, I think it's absolutely right that the government intervenes, um, more so than ever before. And I think it's got to do that partly to kind of just protect businesses. For, you know, forget about businesses thriving. This is just about survival. Um, and, you know, whether it's sectors that have been shut down that will just, that are generally struggling and will not survive this unless they are supported. Um, or it is about thinking about how we build the recovery and how we kind of, you know, diversify our business space, how we bolster businesses up in the North and the Midlands as part of the levelling up agenda. Um, but, but for me, the critical question, so we're going to have this completely unprecedented situation where the government is likely to be propping up pretty much every sector of the economy. And that is absolutely huge, like, and, you know, a conservative government nonetheless. And, you know, there are big choices and decisions the government needs to make with as it does that. And if it thinks about bailouts, I think the thing that it must not do is just hand out bailouts with no conditions. So we did that in 2008. You know, we bailed out the banks, but we didn't, as taxpayers, require or ask anything of them. And I think there's a really critical role for the government to say, of course, we will step in to support businesses. We've got to, they would be mad not to. But actually, we want something in return. And if you take something like, for example, the aviation sector, actually, you know, what we're seeing in Germany is that they've stepped in, uh, they've, you know, offered a massive bailout, but they've taken an equity stake so that actually when, you know, the, the airlines start doing better, the taxpayer gets a return from it. But they're also attaching conditions, uh, conditions around retaining your workforce, conditions around, uh, you know, not paying out huge amounts um, of dividend payments as you are trying to recover. And I think that's the sort of thing that our government should look at. You know, we gave a loan uh, to EasyJet of 600,000 with no conditions about whether or not they lay off their workers. Uh, with no conditions on not about how they recover in a way that is climate change compatible that surely cannot be the way through this um, so I think it is right that the government steps in I think it's right that the government does its bit um, but I think it needs to be smart about how it does that and it needs to be thinking about the economy we want to create at the other side of this and how it uses its interventions to try and support that and accelerate that change We've actually got an episode on this already. So it's called The New Command Economy with uh, Roman Friedman and Rob Johnson. Um, and we talked exactly about this issue. And I'm wondering, with these bailouts, would it actually be irresponsible for uh, the government not to make one of the conditions you can't have zero hours contracts, Miata? Absolutely. So, you know, I think, I think there is a contract. I think there's a contract between government, citizens and the private sector that says, of course, the taxpayer will come in and help. Of course it must, because in the end, we all suffer if our businesses don't do well. But my goodness, at the end of this, we need a different settlement. So things like zero hour contracts, you know, things like, you know, paying poverty wages, it sh just should not be acceptable. Um, and actually the quid pro quo of huge support should be social responsibility, environmental responsibility, so that there are wider returns that come out of this. But Richard, we, can, you, uh... we, can do, we can do that anyway, right? So, so those might all be good ideas. Um, 
uh, we could have a whole debate on each one of those things. But but all of those things are within the government's gift anyway. The government can, could could say, you know, no more zero hours contracts for everyone. Um, and so I wouldn't I wouldn't want to tie the two things together because you're going to create so much debate about each little thing on on this on the pure topic of should they bail out be bailed out um, and take big equity stakes. I agree with you. Five years ago, I wouldn't have agreed with you for two, two reasons. My changing th change, my thinking changed big time. First one is Glasgow, um, one of the cities I talk about in my book where I spend a lot of time. And I now think, like looking back, that the, the, the way that we allowed shipbuilding, British shipbuilding, to disappear, Glasgow and Govan was its real beating heart. We have the best industry in the world, bar none, um, was the biggest industrial strategy failing in the history of the UK, easily. And it's still echoing today in Glasgow. And there's both parties, it's not a party political thing, it's the, a whole, we got it wrong for a period of, sort of 15, 20 years. And then more recently, in, in my recent research, one of the questions as macroeconomists we get stuck on is, uh, why, do, why do slumps last so long? Like most models suggest that you're going to sort of come back to some kind of equilibrium. And one of the most promising things in the very latest research is that basically it's companies, it's whole cohorts of companies that would have started up and would have prospered in 2008, 2009, 2010. And that effect just echoes through time and we're still feeling it today. So for those two reasons, the sort of socioeconomic and, and, the, and, the, and the lingering that we get from these, these crashes, I would back everything Rishi Sunak's doing and more. But because I'd want to do it really fast, I'd want to keep it really simple. And I would divorce it from those questions of zero hours contracts, the green economy and so on. Not because I don't think that's important, but I think, you know, the Treasury is really powerful. It can control those things whenever it wants to. So, you know, kick those out of the way for a year and just bail the com companies out right now. That's what we need to do. So if you're at home, don't forget, if you've got a question, ask away on the YouTube comments or on Twitter using hashtag Coronanomics. Now, Ben, what was your moment of the week? Well, as I mentioned in the intro, there was uh, anyone who's sort of been an economics journalist over the past decade would have noted the moment when the European Commission suggested issuing mutually guaranteed debt uh, across the EU, because this is something that's been was at that all through the eurozone crisis. There was this clamour for euro bonds. We had a clamour more recently for Corona bonds as well. We didn't get that, but it seems like the Rubicon might just have been finally crossed. That the the ceiling might have finally cracked, and we might be getting um, jointly issued European debt. So quite a moment for uh, well for economics journalists, but also for for the European continent because. This isn't a huge amount of money. I think it's about, uh, well, it's 750 billion euros. It's not all in one year. It's not, a, it's not a stimulus that's going to be off the scale by any means. But it is a moment for them to actually have been have suggested it. And it looks like because France and Germany, the two obviously most important uh, countries now that the UK has left in uh, the European Union, have backed it or something very similar, that we're actually going to get it. So I think that's, that's definitely the moment of the week for me. We've been talking about the, sort of... Have the, yeah, the, go on, Richard. Have the, German, the, have, the, have the Germans backed it? Well, the Germans backed the 500 billion uh, euros of grants. And what the European Commission has done is sort of added 250 billion euros of loans on top of that. So um, I don't think the Germans would balk at those loans on top. So, I, you know, there's a lot of talk saying that Angela Merkel wants this to be her legacy her European legacy, because of course she's due to step down as Chancellor next year. So, I, th you know, I wouldn't have predicted that this would have happened a year ago, two years ago, certainly not five years ago. So I think it's a testament to how, fa how fast things have moved in a way. I mean, we talked earlier um, about what, you know, uh, what governments have done, what central banks have done. We've got a, qu a question from Tony Yates, great man, great economist, um, on, the similar, on the subject here. As you can see, what he's asking is, have fiscal authorities and central banks done enough? Well, my answer to that, I'll listen to yours uh, in, a, in a moment, Richard and Miata. My answer would be, I think they have for now. I think the real test will become in the, in the recovery phase. I think, you know, they're going to have a really tough, and we mentioned this before, a tough job to do of balancing, controlling inflation and also stimulating the economy. So I think in the crisis itself, pretty good performance 
by uh, by governments and central banks. But there's a the real test still to come. What do you think about that, Richard? Um, kind of the same. I think um, the Treasury were really quick. I think they're really good um, uh, uh, and bold. Um, so it's like. How 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 should we how should we think about how should we measure these um, policy things? Stepping back from a bit, sort of how quick are they? Good, I think, very good. Um, how simple and easy to access are they? You know, like uh, is implementation a problem? And on that, I think sort of less good. I th on my latest count, I think there are three different loan schemes, and now there's the equity scheme. If you're running a business, it, 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 I, I looked at it today. It is pretty complicated. Um, but you know, that's 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 a secondary point to the the size and the speed of it, which is good. Mm. If you turn to the bank, one of the things that I worry about, um, and I think the bank didn't do well during the financial crisis, and um, we just need to really monitor it now, is this difference that can appear between bank rates. So that's the rate that um, Andrew Bailey and the rest of the MPC can set is the Bank of England's rate. And the actual interest rates that um, exist in, in the macro economy. So in 2008, what happened is the bank rate got set to, to basically zero, but interest rates in terms of mortgage rates, and particularly the rates that firms were f facing to borrow, did not follow them down. And we just need to be careful that that wedge between, because nobody actually pays interest rate, a bank rate, right? You, none of you guys pay it. None of the companies you buy stuff from pay it. It's, just, it's, a, it's a sort of market rate. The rates that really matter are the rates that households and firms are facing. And those were allowed to drift away from bank rate following the last big crash we had. And we just need to make sure that that isn't happening now. Miata, would you say that the complexity of what the government's done has been uh, a drawback as it held back its effectiveness? Um, well, I think it's always hard to design these sorts of schemes. Um, I think there has been kind of delay in implementation. Um, and you hear that, you know, anecdotally from businesses saying that they sort of struggle to access particular schemes. But I mean, it's all going back to the question. The thing that's really interesting is the bank has done what it can do, but actually monetary policy was pretty constrained. When interest rates are you know, historically low, there was actually not that much room to maneuver for the banks, which means that that leaves it on kind of fiscal policy. You know, that leaves it down to government to sort of basically weather this and take up a lot of the slack. And, you know, and to be fair to the government, it has done a lot more than I expected it to do. Uh, I think the kind of job retention scheme, I think the support that it's provided in order to secure jobs has been absolutely critical. Um, and the support it's provided to businesses, I think, has been helpful. I suspect there's more that needs to be done. So at the moment for businesses, what the government is doing is, yes, providing some loan schemes and then essentially co covering the liabilities in terms of your workforce. But companies who, you know, have their rents to pay, who have uh, their debts to pay, they can't, the longer that the lockdown or social distancing lasts, particularly for retail hospitality, they cannot borrow month in, month out, not knowing what the recovery is going to look like, not knowing if demand will come back to their sectors. Um, and so that leaves them in a really difficult position. And I don't think the government has quite cracked that yet, because I think it probably needs to think about how it helps on the um, cost side. For me, the big gap in what the government has done um, comes back to social security, comes back to the safety net. So we are seeing record levels of unemployment levels we probably haven't seen since uh, the 1980s. Uh, the OBR is predicting a 2 million increase. It's likely to probably be more than that at the end of this. And, uh, you know, and, you know, the analysis that we've done suggests that there's something like 5.6 million people who are falling through the cracks of the government's job retention scheme, its income support scheme, and are having to rely on universal credit, which is woefully inadequate, was before the crisis, is more so now. And yes, the government has put in seven billion more, uh, but you know, asking people to live on 90 quid odd a week, and yes, there are other benefits that might come in terms of housing allowance, et cetera, but that's not enough given that you're about to have a huge number of people come onto the system that have much higher cost base and liabilities, uh, you know. And so I, I don't think the government's got this right. Um, and I think as the story around livelihoods and hardship becomes clear, I think that will create a problem. But I think there's also an economic rationale to it. So it's not just about, you know, caring about people struggling. 
But, you know, Social Security is an automatic stabiliser. We have to find a way out of this recession. And Social Security has always been a way in which we try to do that. The Social Security system has been massively denuded over the last 10 years. So one of our automatic stabilisers is not firing in the way that it should do. Um, so as the government thinks about how it stimulates the economy coming out of this, and we'll come on to, you know, what a fiscal stimulus package looks like, I think yes. it ought to be thinking about how you bolster social security within that. So there's both a kind of social justice rationale, but there's also a clear economic rationale as well. Okay, what, well, what, don't forget, what you, sorry, Richard, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, what are, what are you guys, like, you know, you guys are reporters, you get way more time to talk to all sorts of different people. What are you hearing from um, either companies, on the first point on, on the automate on companies, or... I, I, hadn't, I haven't read your report of that part of it. Sorry, Matt, I hadn't heard this thing of people falling through. Um, I thought they tried to plug the holes in, for example, the self-employed and stuff like that. Are there still big groups of people that are falling through the various schemes? I think one of the big ones was people who had started a job in between the cutoff points. Um, so there was a woman who wrote into us um, who had left one job and then uh, she started another one, but they said they didn't want to take her on. They delayed the start date, start date and the old company, Selfridges, wouldn't furlough her. So then she had to go on to universal credit and she's saying, what about us? You know, we, we've just been forgotten. And there are loads of different categories uh, just like that. Yeah, I've been writing about companies which haven't been able to get loans because they don't pay business rates because the landlord does it on their behalf. And that's a, that's a very obvious crack uh, who, who are not being reached by the government's loan scheme. Um, don't forget, if you've got a question for us, leave a question in the YouTube comments or on Twitter, hashtag Coronanomics. Now, we've not really got into it. In fact, we've completely avoided it, but we can't really because it's such an important subject. Dominic Cummings. Now, um, Boris Johnson is going to inordinate lengths to keep his <laughs> special advisor, as we all know. Can any special advisor, Miata and Richard, can any special advisor really be that important? Because you've both been special advisors. Maybe Miata, I'll come to you first, because were you actually a civil servant or were you a, a SPAD when you were doing so, the job? So I was a civil servant and then I was a SPAD for the Labour Party. Right. So I've sort of done both. Um, and uh, uh, no is the answer. <laughs> and actually, <laughs> in any normal world, we're not in a normal world at the moment, but in any normal world, if a special advisor was causing, you know, the, the, the government of the day, the prime minister of the day, this much grief, they would go in a bat of an eyelid. So it's quite <laughs> phenomenal that we're here. Um, it shows how absolutely critical he is uh, to the Johnson operation, that he's willing to take the flack that he's taken. Um, I thought it was quite, you know, astounding, you know, huge announcement today about easing the lockdown. And yet the questions were one after the other about uh, coming. So it, it has been a massive blow. And actually, any minister, any advisor would have probably gone by now. So it's quite remarkable uh, that he sort of dug his heels in. Richard, did you feel that yeah, level I mean, of loyalty I... from George Osborne? Um, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think I um, uh, was faced with this was this with this kind of situation. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure it wouldn't have been the case. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I agree. Um, I think that the really sort of difficult and damaging thing is that while um, it is true that the, the, the civil service is absolutely huge, and so and and the number of spans is huge. There's, there's probably a hundred of them or something. Um, I totally agree with the point that no single person um, is big enough um, and is important enough to try and kind of be allowed to derail a whole government's project. It's also the same case, and I'm sure me and Miata worked in very different kind of scenarios, but I'm sure she'd agree. Despite the fact the state is massive and there are all these employees and all these civil servants, because I've also been a civil servant as well as bad, there's only so much bandwidth, there's only so much time to get stuff done. And so it will be blocking to get stuff done. And it's also, and I'd be interested in, in your guys' as journalist views on this, at some point it, it sort of it, it corrupts the fourth estate um, in the sense that everyone's asking questions about it. And I'd rather we, like, there are some quite sort of simple but really important questions. For example, is it two metres or one metre, right? That's going to make a huge difference to every single pub and restaurant in the country. 
And we're not having a big national debate about that. We're having the debate about like eyesight and some journey. It's, it, it, you know, it's, do you think, but do you think the sort of bloodlust and the need to get a resolution to this is, is going to end or is it just going to roll on and roll on? I feel like well. it's the job of the press to hold it, to hold people to account. But at the same time, I've started hearing comparisons of Dominic Cummings to Caroline Flack. And um, I think actually the public's getting a bit sick of it. So I don't really know how much longer the pressure can continue. But I don't think that um, I think I think that that's the, the press's job to hold people to account. And if it is undermining the public health messaging, then, you know, that's what needs to be done. It just needs to be done yeah, in a sensitive yeah, yeah. way. For and sure. the, way, the way the journalists were stood outside, the way the photographers were stood outside Dominic Cummings' house, that was pretty ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. I mean, personally, I would be the first to sort of criticise the UK media for focusing on trivia. I think this one is pretty important, to be honest, because of the power that is wielded by Cummings and the fact that this, uh, this really speaks to public concerns about one rule for them and one rule for the rest of us. So um, I think in this case, it is justified. How long it's going to last for, I really don't know. I suspect if the opinion polls continue to show that uh, there's a strong majority for him to go and it still continues to hurt Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party in the polls, I think it will stay on the front pages. It will stay as a major issue and he'll probably go in the end. But honestly, who knows? Ooh, put your bets on. Well, don't forget, <laughs> if you've got a question... If you've got a question, ask away on the YouTube comments or using hashtag Coronanomics on Twitter. We're going now to a question from Anna. Anna, are you there? Yeah, There's hello. Anna. What's your question? Hiya. Um, hi, uh, great show so far. Um, so my question is about um, working from home. And um, so research by Nicholas Bloom, for example, has shown that the benefits, productivity of working from home. So do you think, um, even though it's difficult for people now, this will, this will become more the norm in the future and um, uh, and will that actually bring the benefits it's been uh, predicted to have and conversely will it have um, uh, benefits to workers welfare? Richard you've got two twins how's your productivity? <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't want to run an economy on my productivity I'll tell you it's really really bad I, I think it's a really important question Nick Bloom by the way um, you know, the people that are watching this are going to be uh, interested in economics. Read any of Nick Bloom's papers. He's based at Stanford, a British economist. Absolutely fantastic um, uh, research he does. Really interesting, including on uncertainty and how uncertainty affects uh, our lives. On, the, on this particular question, I think it will um, change the way people work and change um, uh, and hopefully increase productivity. For example, um, yeah, you, you asked about our situation, we've actually had a lot of sort of family stuff going on with a, a ill um, child, quite seriously ill over the past couple of years. Lots of people have that kind of thing. That's not the point. The point is that my personal situation is I've been constrained to actually going to stuff and leaving home. And the fact that I can do this at eight o'clock at night um, means that I'm able to contribute in some way to discussion and so on. And I'm able to do stuff like this related to, to my job and I think you know we, we started I think Miata's thing of the week was um, problems for for women in, in the workforce I would hope that this ability to work from home would mean that in some sense you know potentially when the, when when the kids are bad of course that's it's not it, that doesn't sustain a, a full-time job but the ability to not have to travel somewhere and also not have to necessarily work within specific hours um, may help the, the, the economy for sure. Miata, we know that lots of people in society can't work from home and um, you know, if, if the people who can are able to do so more, could we actually see a divide opening up? Yeah, I mean, look, so I think one of the upsides, and there are very few upsides in the current pandemic and the current crisis, but one of the upsides is um, how much technology has been a massive enabler. Uh, so we can work from home because we can Zoom, we can use lots of different things. And I think that is definitely a positive feature that's going to stick around. Um, and I think it's going to create flexibility, actually, in the way that particularly people who have office-based jobs work. Um, I think what's going to be quite in interesting is as we ease the lockdown, you know, some of us will continue working from home, 
others are probably likely to have to work in shift patterns in order not to have so many people in workplaces. And that will kind of force the kind of flexibility. So you don't have to be stuck to your desk. You don't have to be in the office. Um, and I think that's a positive thing for how the labor market works, particularly for people who have caring responsibilities. But the other side of it is, you know, in London, the Southeast, you know, about half the workforce are able to work from home. You go somewhere like, um, you know, Stoke or, uh, you know, Barnsley, that's not the case. It's a far smaller proportion because actually the work requires people to be um, in call centers or in manufacturing or in distribution centers. So there is definitely a polarization there. And I think one of the things that we probably need to think a bit harder about is how we do use technology, which is helping, if you like, professional uh, service sectors be more productive and work in this flexible way. How can you use that technology to actually help people uh, to work more flexibly and better in other types of sectors as well? Because I think there is a risk that we end up having quite a big divide at the other side of this. So, Anna, do you feel that that's um, addressed your question sufficiently? Um, definitely, yeah. Some really interesting angles. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so don't forget, if you have a question like Anna, then uh, ask us on the YouTube comments or on Twitter with the hashtag Coronanomics. We've actually got another question that we had uh, in advance here from uh, an audience member, Anthony Ive. The green recovery that some are talking about, what sort of opportunities you see for the UK and globally, where, does you, where do you see that going? Uh, and also with that, the uh, oil prices are at historic lows. What sort of uh, opportunities do you see in terms of uh, pushing forward with infrastructure spending on, on projects such as electronic cars? How would that impact the geopolitical uh, status of, of different countries? Uh, and obviously the inflationary uh, pressures that are, are, are resulting from increasing when oil prices increase um you know what sort of opportunities do you see in those sort of areas so richard first of all i mean you mentioned you're a bit um, wary about this conditionality element of bailouts but should there be a sort of green element of conditionality or not no i don't i don't think there should be any conditionality i, I don't think we're in that situation honestly on, honestly i think it's that bad i think we need to just yeah get the money to companies right now um but but i but that's not because i don't think we should have a green um green growth because i think we do but 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 i really think it's that urgent i mean you mentioned yourself ben like that some people are slipping through the net like rishi sunak needs to make it as big and as simple as he possibly can separately what can we do on green really interesting and very big question um let's just just notice it down. i mean there are two two things there that essentially i'd be a bit worried are um attentions right so one was the possibility of a green recovery um because of everything that happened but the other is that the oil, oil price has come down right so fuel's going to be really cheap so that's going to tend to sort of stimulate the use of fuel and and push it push against it um i actually think that the 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 main opportunity and this is this might seem a bit kind of bizarre given that we're, what, we're, what we're going through in terms of the public sector is if we come out of this, if we do get a V-shaped recovery, the world's a big riskier if. place. If a very big, very big if. The world is a riskier place. And one of the things we obsess about um, uh, is, you know, are, are we, have we got the money for, it, for infrastructure? And I think now in the UK, if, this, if we get a V um, and we've got sound fiscal position, Borrowing for green investment is exactly borrowing for the future. It stimulates growth. It's for the next generation. Um, it's productivity enhancing. And that's exactly the kind of thing we should be doing in a flagging global economy. Because don't forget the global economy was flagging before we even went into this. Now, Mieta, you at the I new economics. I wouldn't base sorry. it all on the oil price. I wouldn't base it all on the oil price. The oil price is going to do exactly the opposite, right? The oil price is going to want people to spend money on, um, uh, on carbon based activity. Thanks. Yeah, so, Mieta, you at the New Economics Foundation were very keen on a Green New Deal before the last election. I'm just wondering, do you feel that that has come closer as a result of everything we've been through in this, in this lockdown and this pandemic? Um, definitely. And, you know, we, we did a, um, ironically, before actually we hit the uh, pandemic, we did a piece uh, on a recession ready. We, we saw that a recession was coming at some point. We 
didn't couldn't have foreseen uh, just how deep um, and massive it was going to be. But, but there is a huge opportunity for us to think about a fiscal stimulus that is green coming into coming out of this. Um, I think there's a big decision for the government um, about how it looks to stimulate the economy. Um, and for us, it's got to spend. And if you're going to spend a huge amount of money, uh, make it green, spend so you're spending for our future. And actually, you know, we did an analysis um, work based on uh, the Commission on Climate Change work that they've done looking at different kind of schemes and projects that you could get away quite quickly. Things like, you know, home installation, large jobs, you can actually get that out. There are big kind of green infrastructure projects that could be done quite quickly. And that absolutely must be part of a kind of recovery package uh, because it allows us not to do the, not only to do the short term job of stimulating the economy, but it allows us to kind of build out of that. I, I do also think, you know, the, the thing about the Green New Deal was trying to uh, do this transition that we're going to have to do. We're going to have to do it anyway. So it's whether we do it deliberately or whether we do it in the way that we're having to respond to this crisis, kind of, you know, firefighting and panicking. So we're going to have to do it. And we know that there are going to be winners and losers. And we know that there is a big risk that as we kind of drive the industrial transition, that certain communities are going to be pretty hard hit. And ironically, it's the communities that have been hard hit in the past. So when we've looked at the analysis of jobs that would be lost, a lot of these jobs are concentrated in the North and Midlands. A lot of them are concentrated in the very areas that have been struggling um, over the course of the last, you know, forget 10 years, 40 years, quite frankly. Um, and so there is a really important piece around if we're going to transition and we're going to use a fiscal stimulus to do that, how do we make it as just as possible? And uh, in part, that's about how you retrain people to enter new jobs and new opportunities. Um, in part, that's thinking about how you build some of the social infrastructure around some of these communities. So, you know, the Green New Deal was all about how do we transition, but transition in a way that tries to deal with some of the social justice challenges that we're going to have to do if we want public consent for a green transition, but also for kind of fairness and equity reasons. And that feels so pertinent now. I think it's harder because actually the, the scale of the crisis, the impact on both communities that were struggling, but actually communities that were doing okay is much greater, but that creates quite a big imperative for us to think really hard about the set of interventions that can help us do this in the right way. Uh, you know, and my big hope is uh, out of this crisis, which I think is gonna be pretty painful, that, that we use that space to build back better, that we use that space to say, you know, there were big problems with our economy before, everyone saw it, and if they didn't see it, actually the pandemic has kind of revealed that in stark, painful ways, and I think that it's only gonna be clearer and more painful over the course of the next year. So, you know, we have a chance and opportunity to think about how we reconfigure and rebuild our economy in a way that tries to address some of these deep-seated inequalities and structural problems that we had before. Um, but, but that is one hell of a task for policymakers. It is not easy, but my goodness, if ever you were going to do it, surely this is the moment that you do it. Indeed. Well, in the words of our guest uh, this week, never let a crisis go to waste. That's what Jim O'Neill said. Um, so to those of you at home, don't forget, if you've got a question, feel free to send it in on the YouTube comments or on Twitter, hashtag Coronanomics. We might have time for it next week. Um, we've also got another question from Gavin Simpson. Is, is Gavin there? Uh, Richard Davis recently tweeted about mergers, and we were wondering whether uh, there would be more mergers and acquisitions occurring now that basically wouldn't have happened beforehand uh, in normal times because of the fundamental weaknesses of these companies. So for example, uh, Deliveroo and Amazon and Carlsberg and Marston. Richard, everyone's been playing fancy m and at home. Do you think it's a good time for the vultures to swoop? Are they? Um, 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 yeah, so I, 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 I started out as a kind of antitrust economist. That was my first job in the civil service. One of the things you see is that in downturns, you do get more mergers. Reason being, you got two competitors. They, there were some mentioned there. One gets hit harder than the other. As the economy starts to recover, the, the sort of winner buys the loser out sort of thing. I actually think that one thing we might see coming out of this is um, something called vertical integration. And we talked about supply chains at the start, and that's where you buy your suppliers. 
So um, you buy the people that provide you with, with all their inputs through your supply chain. And because of this concern of how secure a supply chain, some companies may think they want to do that. And that raises some really thorny antitrust competition issues when a big firm owns all the supplies of some important vital input to an industry. So it's something that for sure the UK's um, antitrust watchdog should be looking into. What do you reckon, Miata? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. I think there is, you know, downturns, companies use that opportunity to buy up other companies. So I think it's a, it, it's a huge risk. I think it's likely to happen. Um, and I think it's something that we do need to take quite seriously because I think the worst possible outcome is a world where we get huge kind of concentration, um, you know, in, in certain sectors, we barely have a competitive market anyway, because we've got a handful of kind of big players. The idea that we can have further concentration, I think, is really, really dangerous. And it's in the end going to be bad for consumers. Um, and so I think this is an area where, you know, historically, the government has always been very nervous about uh, overly intervening um, in the, the, basically the market doing what the market does and mergers and acquisitions. And I think this is a time uh, where we've got to be pretty kind of bullish um, in order to, in the end, um, protect the market because actually competition is a good thing, uh, but in the but ultimately protect consumers because, you know, consumers are the ones that suffer if we have an over-concentrated market. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad that Richard uh, mentioned supply chains because that's sort of brought us back to a place close to where we started and we've, we've covered SPADs, monetary policy green new deal we've got an amazing amount of content into the past uh, uh, just under an hour um, unfortunately that's all we've got time for this week it's been fantastic having both of you on richard and miata thank you both for thank joining you. us and thank you everyone for watching us and sending in questions please do keep them coming if we didn't get to yours this week apologies for that um, we'll try and uh, get to it in future weeks perhaps uh, and we also welcome suggestions from everyone on what else we might cover and don't forget to check out our latest episode on YouTube, which comes out this weekend. We've got an interview with former UK Treasury Minister Jim O'Neill and Columbia University Professor Willem Boiter about coronavirus and the markets. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Coronanomics TV for all our latest episodes. Thanks for watching Coronanomics, What Just Happened. Join us next week for more. Goodbye. Goodbye.